It looks like milk, foams like milk, and sometimes even tastes like milk. Yummy! There's some pure milk. Maybe not. Ah! Mm. Soya. It tastes a bit of soya. Oat? Yeah, it tastes like oatmeal, actually. So I would guess that this is oat milk. Okay, this is definitely really off. It, it tastes like a vegetable, but I think I prefer this. That's a pea. Really? Today, the creamy white liquid that we pour over our cereal, in our coffee, and down our throats doesn't necessarily have to come from a mammal. In fact, the notion of milking plants is not new. The earliest written mention of almond milk appeared in a Baghdadi cookbook from 1226. And the humble soybean, known as the cow of China, has been a main source of protein for the Chinese since the 11th century. But it would take a plucky Hong Konger to start a renaissance of interest in soy milk in the East. The particular formulation that Dr. Lo invented 80 years ago, we are still selling as is. I don't think there's anyone I know who has not drank a Vitasoy product. In the last decade or so, the wellness era ushered in an extra woke generation that's turning away from traditional dairy and diving headfirst into a world of alternative milks. Oats, almonds, rice, quinoa, pea. Somewhere, a health food company is milking the $12 billion plant milk market. In Britain, one homegrown startup with a unique proposition has risen to the top of the alternative milk space. Nothing in our drinks and our foods that you don't find in your store cupboard. There's nothing you can't pronounce, nothing you can't spell. Plant-based is taking off everywhere. And from our portfolio of about 20 drinks, there is a suitable portfolio and assortment for every single country. How did these food pioneers change the way we perceive and consume a drink that has been around for thousands of years? It's a taste that's synonymous with breakfast throughout Asia. The creamy, beany, foamy goodness of soy milk. Produced by soaking and grinding a yellow bean, boiling the mixture, and filtering out remaining particulates. For centuries, the soybean has been cultivated and used for food by people in the Orient. Native to Manchuria, the soybean has been cultivated by the Chinese since about 3,000 years ago as a cheap source of protein that yielded much more by acreage than milk, eggs, or meat. But the bean's tough and bitter taste, along with the enzyme trypsin, made entire soybeans largely indigestible. So generations that followed have learned to process the bean into soy sauce, tofu, and soy milk. The earliest record of soybean milk sits on a stone slab from the second imperial dynasty, the Eastern Han in China. Its popularity grew during the Qing dynasty, apparently due to the discovery that gently heating the liquid for at least 90 minutes made it more palatable among lactose intolerant adults. By the 18th century, street vendors were hawking fresh hot soy milk, or doujiang, as a breakfast food. Consumption of soy milk had spread to England by the 14th century. And in 1908, a Chinese gentleman, Li Yuyi, established the Usin de la Caseo Sojan, the world's first soy dairy in the suburbs of Paris. By 1929, two Shanghai factories were selling over 1,000 bottles a day. And another in Beijing was almost as productive itself.
but it would be this name that most of Asia associates with soy milk today. I don't think there's anyone I know who has not drank a Vitasoy product. Here's Vitasoy's sustainability director, Simeon Chang, with the story of how it all began. The year was 1939. World War II had sent refugees fleeing China for next door Hong Kong. And a 27-year-old business graduate by the name of Lo Kui Xiong wanted to help. Our founder, Dr. Lo, was volunteering, so he was visiting the refugees and bringing daily supplies. He noticed that their health wasn't in good shape and they were suffering from malnutrition. Dr. Lo uh, remembered a lecture he attended in Shanghai. The lecturer was telling him about how soy is really the cow of China, how soy can replace the more dairy-based diet. So he started teaching the refugees how to make soybean milk themselves. He noticed very quickly that there is an improvement uh, in health condition. That made him realize that maybe that's the solution for Hong Kong at the time. In 1939, Dr. Lo and four friends formed the Hong Kong Soya Bean Products Company and named their product Vitamilk. But even amongst the Chinese, who were no strangers to the soybean, the strong beanie flavor of Vitamilk took some getting used to. Lo began working with experts on methods for improving taste and production, homogenizing coconut oil into the soy milk to give it a richer flavor. I still remember it the first time I tried. I, I asked the soy milk together with the cereal just to try. And I was really impressed by the way it tastes. The particular formulation that Dr. Lo invented 80 years ago, we are still selling as is. Roberto Guidetti is current CEO of the 80-year-old legacy brand. And Vitasoy's founding purpose is a big reason the Italian was drawn to the company. I was working for a different company before Vitasoy, and uh, I was surprised by the fact in some of these uh, restaurants that we were visiting, on every table there was this beverage in a glass bottle. And so I asked my colleagues, what is this brand? And then they explained to me the history and I felt, wow, this seems to be a very unique proposition and an idea of providing a healthy product, but also providing a product that in a way it is produced is not a burden to the environment. By mid-1941, Vitamilk sales had risen to 1,000 bottles a day. But when the war came to Hong Kong, the company had to shut operations. In 1945, with peace restored, Lo borrowed 50,000 Hong Kong dollars and brought Vitamilk back to production. In a few years, he learned to sterilize and package the soy milk in soft drink bottles instead of the standard half-pint milk bottles, giving it a six months shelf life. The product was rebranded to Vitasoy in 1953, the first beverage of its kind in the world. At this time in the West, plant milk was still relatively unknown outside the circles of vegetarians, hippies, and the odd eccentric like Henry Ford, yes, of the car company, who was an early soy evangelist. Amongst the thousands of products made from him, one of the most extraordinary is Henry Ford's plastic car. Built in 1941, it contained cellulose fibers derived from hemp, sisal, and wheat straw. In 1956, Leslie Cross, vice president of the British Vegan Society, a nascent group of animal rights activists, established the Plant Milk Society, which became the first company in the Western world to make soya milk widely available. In 1977, a small startup in Boulder, Colorado, began manufacturing soy milk. Silk will go on to become one of the largest selling plant-based milk producers in the U.S. Similarly, in 1980 Belgium, Alpro was founded, quickly becoming Europe's leading soy producer. Due to pressure from the dairy industry, 
Producers were not allowed to call their product soya milk, instead having to term it liquid food of plant origin, and later soya plant milk. A string of court victories by Rich Products in Buffalo, New York, between 1949 and 1974, finally established non-dairy milks and products as a new and distinct food, rather than inferior and illegal knockoffs. But the U.S. cattle milk industry has never stopped challenging its plant-based competitors' right to use the word milk and EU law prevents dairy alternatives from using the word if it isn't produced by a lactating mammal. While soy milk was drunk by millions of people in Asia almost every day, over on the other side of the globe, it was a fringe product that sat on frosty health food aisles in Western supermarkets. That was until the dawn of the new millennium. In 2005, Two South Londoners were thinking of getting into the health foods ring. But it was breakfast cereals, not milk, that was on their minds. I'm Camilla Barnard. Uh, I'm co-founder and brand director of Root Health. I'm Nicholas Barnard, or Nick Barnard, and I'm co-founder with Camilla. Other than that, what are you to each other? We are married. <laughs> we remain married after 16 years of Root Health. Nick and Camilla, young parents at the time, were struggling to find the right foods to feed their kids. I mean, I've always loved food, and I think we were just really disappointed with what was available. And cereal packets sit on the table, so you read the ingredient. And I think in doing that, especially in a sort of slightly zombie exhaustion state, I actually read them and realized what low quality a lot of them, a lot of them were. The couple decided that they were going to create a really great muesli with all natural, all organic ingredients, right there in their own kitchen. And at the time, most mueslis were seven, eight, nine ingredients. So when you go to 25, 26, you're really creating an explosion of flavor. But it was hard work. And we chopped and prepared that muesli in this kitchen at this table um, and started to hand selling it around the neighborhood. 4,000 pounds, a few aprons, and the back of the envelope business plan later, the Barnards were peddling their muesli around the neighborhood and to the local health food stores. But their health food startup soon hit a major roadblock. For the first two years, we weren't totally invested in our lives and in our finances in the company. Where the risk came was when we borrowed money on the basis of the ownership of our house and started to employ people. That was a moment of great excitement and determination that then ran straight into the headwinds of the Lehman Brothers the collapse. Worst timing. Where organic was, you know, shamed as being luxurious and expensive. Retailers became risk averse. But by 2010, the economy did bounce back. And so did people's appetite for organic foods. And as they were doling out their cereals at sampling sessions, Nick and Camilla noticed another opportunity. I was finding that more people were asking for something other than milk, because we usually offer milk. Every tasting, there'd be somebody. And at the time, there were options that weren't milk, but they tended to taste pretty rubbish, quite gritty. The ingredients were awful. So that then coincided with a gentleman who was very powerful in the breakfast cereal industry came to visit us in the office and he, had, he made a throwaway remark. Root Health is a great brand. You understand nuts, grains and seeds. You could do an, a drink. Ping, something went off inside the light bulb, which of course is ridiculous because we all knew we could do it. But this was the trigger. In the 1960s, soy milk, or rather Vita soy, was making its rounds in Hong Kong. In 1968, Time magazine ran an article calling it the new soft drink craze of the British Crown Colony. But remaining on the island was never in the plans for founder K.S. Lowe. And the idea to start the company was start the company in Hong Kong, but the vision had always been to do this in the context of Hong Kong and beyond Hong Kong, for China and beyond. 
In the mid-70s, two innovations allowed Vitasoy products to make their leap overseas. The first was Tetra Brick Packaging, constructed of seven layers of paper and plastic coated material, making them much lighter than glass. And the second was UHT, ultra high temperature technology, heating the soy milk above 135 degrees Celsius for a few seconds to kill many bacterial endospores and turning it into long shelf life product. I think Vitus are actually the first company in, in definitely in Hong Kong, if not that part of the world, to bring in uh, and partner with Tetra Pak. But giving the product that sort of six, nine, 12 month shelf life, obviously started to open up a number of doors where it was possible to, to start to freight the, the products around the world. Exports of Vitasoy were going to over 20 countries by the early 1980s. In 1981, Vitasoy became the first Asian soy milk to be imported to North America. But it would be the enormous demand across the border in mainland China, where Vitasoy kicked growth into high gear. Towards the beginning of the 90s, the company leveraging the expertise that we had in Hong Kong, we were able at the beginning to have a, a successful establishment of the business in the South. But when you go into central China and you go into eastern China, we had to develop a different model. And in the case of uh, Wuhan, we developed a model that started from the eating and drinking restaurants on premise business, offering basically our product together with food. In the case of Shanghai, the big trigger for the expansion was our starting our tea business. Today, Vitasoy is a leading player in China's soy milk market, valued at 1.3 billion US dollars in 2018. Besides exporting to 40 markets internationally, it had started production in Australia and New Zealand and took over a tofu business in Singapore, helmed by managing director Chris Marchin. Well, I was a business manager looking after, I was selling milk basically into the supermarkets. To be honest, the Vitasoy brand just resonated very strongly with me. The sustainability angle has always been something that I'm very passionate about. We make many, many different kinds of tofu, which was a very uh, eye-opener for, for an Australian coming over to Singapore. You know, you talk to friends in Singapore, they're surprised that there's someone who looks like me who's making tofu. It takes a lot of water to make tofu, so we've really been able to reduce the amount of water that we do to make a kilo of tofu. And just keep driving those kind of, those kind of agendas. Packaging um, is a big one, so it can either be very easily recycled um, or, or doesn't have a very big impact back into the, in, into the environment. I think really it was always the vision of Vitasoy to really be this plant-based business. And while, yes, there is a very heavy focus on, on, on the liquid side of it. Being able to complement that with the food side, um, I think was always there. Despite its international success, Vitasoy was still only dabbling in the world of soy, until CEO Roberto Guidetti saw an opportunity. Over the last couple of decades, the attention to health and attention to well-being has definitely increased all over the world. It was 20, 2013. So we had to basically, as a company, decide, is this something that is meaningful to us? Should we open and uh, have develop a plant-based portfolio as opposed to continue to grow soy? And we made the decision to then do that and that's because of that decision that uh, happened in 2013 that now as a result, we not only have almond in our portfolio, but we have rice, we have oat, we have coconut, and these are options which are sold with different formulations across different markets. That same year, a pair of South Londoners with a cereal and snack company called Rude Health were also on the cusp of launching a line of non-dairy milks. But just like everything else the Barnards wanted to make, finding the right ingredients, as well as the people who were willing to make non-dairy milk the way they wanted it, proved to be a challenge. There's nothing in our drinks and our foods that you don't find in your store cupboard. There's nothing you can't pronounce, nothing you can't spell. 
we um, work with, as I say, predominantly family-owned and family startup businesses that uh, are good at sourcing with us. But what we do is we push them in the right direction. So we say, okay, you're going to have hazelnuts. We want hazelnuts from Piedmont to the Tondo Gentile hazelnuts. The best hazelnuts in the world. What happens is we end up, we might talk to 10 different producers, but because we keep, we want this ingredient from that particular place, we always end up with one producer who can, who can give us the who ingredients we us. want and do the methods we want and yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's okay with the ridiculous requirements. It's a fine line to between coercion and inspiring. It's co coercion inspiring individuals to, to make the right decision. In 2013, when Root Health launched three flavors of plant milks, oat, brown rice, and almost as an afterthought, almond, they happened to get the timing right. Buoyed by a trend of fit young Instagrammers sharing health foods all over social media, Root Health's almond drink became the company's best-selling item in any category. We got in there at exactly the right time. We were probably the first brand in the UK that, that was a lifestyle dairy-free drinks brand rather than a needs state dairy-free drinks brand. In the plant milk category, publicity is everything. Look no further than a little oat milk brand known as Oatly. Crafted in the 1990s by Swedish food scientist Ricard Oste, Oatly went from a little known Swedish brand to the world's largest selling oat milk producer with the help of some attention grabbing ad campaigns. Having spent years making great food in dour packaging, the Root Health team realized that their communications needed some changing up. Dairy alternative drinks is a really relatively new category, and a lot of shoppers come into it completely blind, so not really knowing what they're looking for, either from a brand or also in terms of flavor or functionality. So these were our first uh, dairy-free drinks that we launched with, brown rice, almond, and oat drink. So we very quickly definitely wanted to elevate the packaging so that it's brighter, bolder, and we really bring out color. The color is totally different. It pops, it's vibrant. Because our packs are so bright, we stand out in a sea of sameness. Then there's also messaging on pack, but it's also really important that they know that our almond drink is made with only natural ingredients. Or if they pick up our oat drink, it's really important that they know that our oat drink is actually gluten-free, which a lot of oat drinks aren't. So here we are uh, again this year at the Root Health World Bulk Snorkeling Championship. We put a huge emphasis on experiential and event marketing. So we think it's really important to actually get out face to face with the people who buy our brand or who could buy our brand and get our drinks into their hands. But like dairy, the plant-based movement isn't without its own controversies, which these pioneers will soon find out. Drinking milk as we know it is a recent phenomenon. Only in the 20th century, with the introduction of mandatory pasteurization, where milk is heated to kill off any bacteria, did the drink become safe enough for most people. The First World War pushed the Brits at a time when food was limited and child malnutrition rife to start consuming milk as the original superfood. Dairy products of all kinds to supply nutrition needs of United States civilians, United States servicemen, and our allies. In the U.S., the Attlee and Truman governments both passed measures to ensure milk was available free with school meals. And more recently, the Got Milk campaign sent a loud and clear message. If you wanted your children to grow up big and strong, they needed to be drinking milk. Most of us are, in fact, born milk drinkers. Babies' guts produce the enzyme lactase, which breaks down lactose, the sugar in breast milk and cow's milk, into the simpler sugars. But for the majority of humans, production of the enzyme lactase plummets after weaning. 
It is the reason that worldwide, more than two-thirds of all adults are considered lactose intolerant, and a glass of the white stuff can induce bloating, stomach pains, and diarrhea. The allure of cow's milk began its decline in the 70s. In 1975, the average American consumed around 130 liters of milk per year. In 2017, it was just 66 liters. 1,000 dairy farms in the UK closed between 2013 and 2016. Milk's reputation as a healthy food is also under threat from anxieties about bovine antibiotics, animal cruelty, and the industry's environmental impact. Sometime in the early 2000s, the idea of clean eating became popular in the U.S., spreading contagiously across social media from the Western world to Asia. This trend towards healthier foods, it's when organic foods became more and more desired across Asia because of rising middle classes, more concerned parents, people that were traveling abroad. That would have happened around 10 to 15 years ago that you started seeing organic products coming on shelf. But in the last five years, there's been this huge rise in what I call the barista coffee culture. Coffee shops are the hottest thing going in Asia, even from an investment point of view. And obviously the rise of Starbucks over the last five to 10 years has played a part in people knowing and being exposed to things like almond milk. And then in the last couple of years, oat milk. And then finally, of course, especially in the last 18 months, the rising environmentalism movement, flexitarianism. We were starting to see ethical brands. We were starting to see conscious consumerism. In 2013, Vitasoy made the strategic decision to join the wider plant-based revolution, dedicating its massive R&D departments to opening new frontiers. I had basically personally already stopped uh, um, uh, animal uh, liquid uh, dairy milk before joining the company for health reasons. And I found that to be very inspiring. There was a real person who had started the company with a, with a, with a view to achieve a certain outcome. And that this, despite so many years, this pioneering idea, it was now ripe for mainstream. In addition to its classic range of soy milk, Vitasoy introduced almond, coconut, and oat. It enriched the nutritional benefits in its different products with added calcium, vitamin D, dietary fiber, and other essential micronutrients. Produced a low sugar range of drinks, and a barista range to serve the health-conscious coffeegoers. Anytime that they're opening a new front um, is something that requires a longer lead time than you think. I mean, we were talking before about our entry into the almond segment. You can obtain a milk that has this profile in many different ways. You can actually use uh, real almonds, raw almonds, almond paste. You can use oils, right? So these are a number of things that you don't necessarily know at the beginning, but then through maybe two to three iterations, you then, the company on, on a base of expertise you already have, becomes, becomes ever more competent. But then in addition to that, uh, the fact that the company started expanding uh, outside of its original home uh, region, gave us new insights about how to formulate this product. So for example, in uh, Australia, a number of people who were trying the original formulation gave feedback that they would have liked the color to be different, they would have liked the texture to be different, they would have liked the taste to be a bit less green and to be a bit more neutral, right? And so the company obviously learned how to adjust and that was a, a, a significant success. Lucy knew switching to planet-friendly oat milk would make her feel good. She just didn't expect that. Vita Soy has essentially two markets that it's going for. What they did very cleverly, I think, is that they created an entirely different range, which they launched in Australia. And that one is organic, it is more neutral, and it has almond, oat, and soy as well. It's done really well, so well that they've now brought it to the rest of the region. It's more than just nourish us with protein and calcium, it's kinder to the planet too. Vitasoy, let's grow a better world. 
The 80-year-old soy giant is also leveraging its huge geographic advantage to crack nascent markets in the region and secure its spot as the Asian leader of plant milk. We have found often that the conversation about this particular movement tends to be a bit Western-centric. For some of us, or most of us who are part of this, we feel that Asia is actually an incredibly important point to be made because if we're looking at population trends, and if you're looking at where the solutions are actually going to be needed the most, is Asia. 2016, a decade after the Barnards made their first foray into healthy foods, Root Health is now sitting on a line of alternative milks, everything from pea to tiger nut. Now, in terms of how crowded the market is, I would say that it's getting higher and higher. And we see that there is the biggest strongholds dominate. In almond greens and silk is around 50% of the market in North America. So they have a loyal consumer base, some of them, and it is difficult to compete with them. So we can see that there are a lot of like a smaller brands are nimble, are gaining ground. We see players like, for example, Opie, which has built this very strong brand personality around the environment. You know, what we should all be swapping to, uh, to contribute to the environment in a positive way. Root Health is one of those players that um, has positioned itself very well into the health and wellness space, not only because it's organic, and uh, uh, organic obviously is that added sustainability um, angle as well to the product. That year, Root Health opened its first cafe, which served as a creative space to showcase their products. I think one day um, the office was too big for the amount of staff that worked for Root House. So um, someone had the idea, let's open a cafe. And then two weeks later, a uh, wall was built. So literally Ooh. behind this wall is the office. That's the office. Like, yeah, and voila, we've got a cafe. That's innovation executive Ferg, who used to be the cafe's chef and manager. We obviously try and use our products in our kind of ever changing daily menu. Um, so we use a lot of our drinks in, in our hot dishes, for example, curries. Our cashew nut drink is brilliant in a, uh, in a curry, and so is our coconut drink, where it's kind of a living, breathing um, opportunity for us to showcase our products and uh, get direct feedback from customers. And you'll be surprised to learn that the cafe would serve up good old dairy as well. Yeah, we do sell dairy. Our kind of ethos is, is nourishment and joy and, and choice. So we don't say, no, we don't serve that, because as long as it's quality ingredients, then, then we serve it here. But in 2017, the company's message of inclusion and celebration of food got them into trouble with some of their customers. We put up a post on Instagram, and it was talking about um, quality across the board. So if you were to choose dairy alternatives, you should choose Root Health. Then if you also were to choose uh, dairy, you should go for really uh, high quality dairy. The post incensed the vegan community and triggered a boycott. We had no idea about the fallout because actually we'd used that exact post before. Uh, and we'd been talking about dairy for years. What was a real surprise to us, a real shock to us, was this assumption that if we make dairy-free drinks, we, we must be against dairy, which just had not crossed our minds. Why do you have to be against one thing to do another thing? The Root Health team quickly reworked their messaging, distancing themselves from the political and prescriptiveness of the category, and instead focusing on taste. So we've got three creatives going out for our advertising campaign. So for example, one of the posters says, take a stand against bland. So take a stand is really big, which plays on how the category is quite political and usually pulls on those kind of heartstrings. But really, we're telling people to take a stand against bland. Um, another one says, you can go dairy-free without going flavor-free. We like to offer choice and quality uh, and versatility, and really let people make their own decisions about what they eat or drink at the end of the day. In case you haven't heard, 
there's a worldwide craze for non-dairy milk. In December 2018, Brooklyn cafes and grocery stores were sent into crisis mode as the supply of Oatly, the oat drink that devotees say makes for a creamier, tastier latte than even cow's milk, runs dry. Turns out Brooklynites have been chugging the oat drink faster than its Swedish manufacturer could make it. And it's an utter disaster. One Amazon seller is even charging 200 US dollars for a 12 pack of the barista blend, shipping not included. Today, even high street coffee shops like Starbucks has soy, coconut, almond, and oat milk at the ready for your morning coffee. Alternative milk is a market expected to be worth 21.5 billion US dollars in 2024. For a start, I am lactose intolerant, so I don't really take dairy milk. There are times that I'm having uh, this kind of uh, stomach discomfort if I'll be taking a lot of dairy products. So I do drink non-dairy milk, preferably oat milk in my coffee every morning without fail. Goodbye. We noticed is that the, the younger generations seem to be more likely to take it up. Looking just at the Asia Pacific region, particularly females aged 25 to 34. So grain-based uh, milk, we see a compound annual growth rate of 8.37% up to 2025. So this is from a small base compared with say traditional milk, but those sort of growth rates, rice-based is 9.58%, seed-based 5.18%, nut milk 4.85%. Those sort of growth rates say to me that this is not a fad, that this is um, going to grow, um, from a small base, grow quite substantially, certainly during the course of this decade, I imagine into the next one as well. With studies showing that vegetarianism and veganism as the single most effective way to reduce one's own environmental footprint, the meteoric rise of milk with a Y was partly down to its reputation for being friendly on the planet. But around 2015, plant milk, specifically almond, was embroiled in an environmental scandal when a Mother Jones article pointed out that it takes 23 gallons of water to produce a single gallon of almond milk. While this is still lower than 30 gallons of water for cow's milk, the fact that 80% of the world's almonds are produced in drought-ravaged California still came as a shock to the public. This time, London-based alternative milk startup, Rude Health, managed to sidestep any criticism, thanks to a far-sighted business decision made early on. Interesting thing with the almonds, part of the reason it was a really great sort of proposition product for us was because the almonds were sourced in Sicily, which is somewhere that's grown almonds for thousands of years. Um, I'm at, they've got a particular type of almond that has a really intense flavour um, and their, it, the farming system there, it works perfectly. It's a completely sustainable crop. They, they have enough rain, um, so it's not reducing the water table. It's not damaging the bees, whereas we were really aware, because we're a bit obsessive, um, that there was a huge problem even, you know, eight, ten years ago with um, the way almonds are produced in California. It's, it's on an enormous scale and it's a monoculture and it's damaging to the environment, the water table, the bees, the people who are farming it, everything is, is extractive. So for us, it was, it was a huge win to be able to do, I mean, find an almond drink that we were happy with the sourcing of as well as the, the flavour of. It made it was more expensive, but it's still it's bestseller, so it still worked. People were prepared to pay. By 2013, Root Health was exporting its sustainable plant milk all over the world, from the Netherlands, Costa Rica, Portugal, Russia, parts of the Middle East, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Heading its global expansion is Carline Odener. Plant-based is taking off everywhere. There is not a single market where this is not a growing trend. 
And from our portfolio, are about 20 drinks, there is a suitable portfolio and assortment for every single country. Plus that we do a lot of inspirational recipe videos to explain consumers how they can use our drinks, for example. We created a e-magazine with recipes from all over the world. And that goes from sushi rolls to waffles to spring rolls from Vietnam to dumplings from China. Britain's number one organic plant milk brand is also setting its sights on the massive consumer market of China. So uh, this is our Chinese name. Because of the changing customer behavior in China, they cannot travel during the pandemic and they are more health cautious. And so that's why they want more premium brand, Western brand to be selling in uh, Alibaba. A year after being approached by Alibaba, Root Health began trading on its subsidiary platform T-Mall Global at the start of 2021, leveraging China's massive e-commerce marketplace to bypass food import regulations and paperwork. This is Rudy Health. This is a very famous organic milk brand. It started in 2005. In March 2021, Root Health began its own live streaming events, a platform on which 30% of China's population watch influencers push various products. And they will even try the product in front of the camera and tell about their feelings and also they would uh, suggest uh, some uh, usage occasion as well. Chinese consumer, you can think of, they are very open-minded and adventurous. They try any new things. They are happy with all the new devices or new method of uh, communication. <laughs> The same year, Root Health received a B Corp certificate after 16 years, formalizing its status as a business that balances people, planet, and profit. This is not about this is the right grain or the right nut. It's about you have this rainbow, this, this, this a whole a group of different uh, drinks that we make that allow you to express yourself and your meal occasion or your drink occasion accordingly. With environmental concerns at the center of today's plant milk revolution, international plant milk company Vitasoy has looked hard at going green in the last decade. I think sustainability is something that is uh, a more mature uh, topic in the Western world, uh, but I think in Asia Pacific is fast becoming mainstream. And so a lot more uh, consumers are talking about it. ESG is, has become uh, important in attracting um, not just consumers but also investment. Household brand Vitasoy has been using cartons made with FSC certified paper. This means that in the span of about five years, we have reduced over 20 percent of our, our energy use and water use in our manufacturing facilities group wide. We developed an internal sustainable farming guidelines and we have implemented that guidelines to all our contract farms in Australia and in mainland China. So we have made a conscious effort to trace all our uh, raw materials suppliers back to the origin to make sure that none of our raw materials are associated with de deforestation. In 2018, Environmental groups estimated that of the 43,000 tons, or 19 swimming pools worth of drink cartons discarded in Hong Kong's landfills each year, a majority belonged to Vitasoy products. The company responded by recognizing that its product packaging does generate waste when discarded and has been working on a solution to recycle them. In Hong Kong, we are the biggest importer uh, of the paper carton packaging. So we feel a high responsibility in dealing with this issue. There is one facility in Hong Kong dedicated to recycling uh, used paper cartons. So this facility has only come to become available in recent years. 
uh, in the past year or two, we have rolled out a project in both education and a program to help to collect more of these cartons back for recycling. So we started going to schools and explain to them uh, the importance of recycling and how uh, the paper cartons can be collected for recycling. And then we also expanded that program to other places like uh, residential complexes, uh, shopping malls, uh, supermarkets, um, even some petrol stations now have those recycling bins. Buy the soy. The squirrel better world. In 2020, Vitasoy joined the top 30 most sustainable companies in the Hang Seng Corporate Sustainability Index. Even as 2020 proves to be a challenging year for all businesses, Vitasoy managed to complete expansion projects in mainland China and Hong Kong, sustain revenue growth in Australia and New Zealand, and expand its operations in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think we're in a very nice place because of the history that we've had, the family values and the purpose that have come forward. I think it's respecting where you've come from, um, respecting the, the, the years and years and years that have gone into developing these products. Um, you want to make sure that you stay true to that while being able to evolve, modernize, and continue to look forward as well. The jury is still out on whether plant milk's popularity is a fad. But if an 80-year-old soy milk brand and Britain's leading health food company tell us anything about innovation, it's that it never gets old. <laughs>